Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's The Scientist webinar. My name is Susan Harrison Uy, Engagement Manager for The Scientist, and I will be moderating our discussion. Today, our panel of experts will discuss the role of exosomes in the tumor mi microenvironment. We like our webinars to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, and the panelists will address these during the Q&A session following the presentations. To ask a question, simply type your query into the question box located on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. We will try to address as many of these questions as we can during our Q&A session. The webinar platform is user-friendly. You can move or resize any of the windows by simply grabbing them at the top or stretching them at the bottom right-hand corner. You may need to move or minimize some of the windows to see the live view. The webinar will be archived on the Scientist website, and we will send you the link via email within a couple of days. Please note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our webinar sponsor. Beckman Coulter Life Sciences is dedicated to empowering discovery and scientific breakthroughs. The company's global leadership and world-class service and support delivers sophisticated instrument systems, reagents, and services to life science researchers in academia and commercial laboratories, enabling new discoveries in biology-based research and development. A leader in centrifugation and flow cytometry, Beckman Coulter has long been an innovator in particle characterization and laboratory automation, and its products are used at the forefront of important areas of investigation, including genomics and proteomics. For more information, please visit BeckmanCoulter.com. You can also follow Beckman Coulter Life Sciences on Twitter at BCI Life Sciences, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Beckman Coulter has provided us with some helpful resources related to exosome isolation, and we have posted these in our resource list located on the left side of the screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. And with that, let me introduce our first speaker, Dr. David Leiden. Early work in Dr. Leiden's laboratory resulted in several fundamental discoveries that involved the role of bone marrow-derived stem and progenitor cells in tumor vasculogenesis and in metastasis. Dr. Leiden and colleagues subsequently identified two bone marrow-derived cell types, endothelial progenitor cells and hematopoietic progenitor cells of myeloid origin that both participate in the formation of new blood vessels in the primary tumor that occurred by vasculogenesis as opposed to angiogenesis. Dr. Leiden's laboratory then went on to show that secreted factors by the primary tumor prime certain tissues for tumor cell engraftment. His laboratory defined the concept of the pre-metastatic niche. At the pre-metastatic niche, newly recruited bone marrow-derived myeloid progenitor cells collaborate with other cell types residing in the tissue parenchyma. Together, these cells provide a platform of pro-inflammatory molecules such as the S100 family members, growth factors, matrix-degrading enzymes, and adhesion molecules, thereby accelerating assembly of the metastatic lesion. Dr. Leiden's team's investigation of tumor-secreted factors that mediate the crosstalk between tumors and cells in the remote metastatic microenvironment has led to his discovery that tumor-secreted microvesicles, known as exosomes, initiate pre-metastatic niche formation by educating stromal cells and bone marrow progenitor cells, thus supporting a pro-metastatic microenvironment. His laboratory has identified key proteins and the presence of nucleic, nucleic acid in exosomes that support thrombosis generation and pre-metastatic niche formation. Along with co-first author Dr. Ayuko Hoshino, an instructor in molecular biology at Wheel Cornell Medicine, Dr. Leiden has identified the role of tumor exosomal integrins in organotropic metastasis, or why cancer spreads to specific organ sites. Dr. Leiden? Yes. Thank you, Susan, and we're delighted to be here today. And um, we're going to be talking about the role of tumor exosomes as crosstalk mediators in preparing pre-metastatic niches at the metastatic microenvironment. And as you can see on this long list of tumor secreted factors, there's growth factors, chemokines, hormones, extracellular matrices that can actually circulate, 
And here I show microvesicles and exosomes. And lastly, cell-free nucleic acids is a big area of interest with circulating DNA. So much has been studied about the primary tumor and the tumor cell, and only recently there has been interest in the cells participating in metastases, the cells of the tumor microenvironment and metastatic microenvironment. But little work has been done on the tumor secreted factors. And today's lecture is really focusing on one of those secreted factors, exosomes, which I will, will describe in more detail on the next following slide. So here is just an outline, if you look at the upper panel, as medical students, graduate students, and, you know, professors later on in your careers, the feeling, the dogma, is that primary tumors and the tumor cell itself dictates metastases. The tumor cell breaks off in circulation and then goes and implants itself at distant sites. But if you look at the bottom panel, we know that's not the whole story, since cells such as bone marrow-derived cells and local cells in the lung or future sites of metastases also participate in the metastatic process. But I'm highlighting to the left where I have those little dots Secreted factors such as exosomes may be the key players that help the mediation and communication between tumor cells and cells at distant sites to enable the metastatic process to continue. On the next slide, this is really something that's quite striking that was published at the same time as our Nature paper back in October 2015. Here you can see this is a commentary by three physicians in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the perspective really was stating that we don't have a good blood test or any kind of test for that matter to help the clinician predict whether a cancer patient is going to have progressive disease and metastatic disease. So basically, most cases, we wait for the presence of metastatic disease. We are in desperate need for new technology to help us predict which patients are likely to proceed to metastases. And here, back in the 1980s, where you see that blue-gray taller bar, was the discovery of prostate-specific antigen, and that has helped reduce patient, prostate cancer patients who present with metastatic disease. But it hasn't gone down to zero, indicating we need other tests. And then the pink smaller bar graph shows the mammogram, which has not helped women with breast cancer predict which women will go on to develop metastatic disease. So it sounds hard to believe, but there is no indicator that can help the clinician identify a certain population of patients who will require more aggressive therapy. At the same time, it'll help identify patients that shouldn't be subjected to all aggressive therapies if they have, they don't present with a particular marker of metastases. Why treat everybody the same? That brings us to our studies of exosomes. So in this slide, the blue cells that you see are normal lung, and the air space, the pre-metastatic lung, is that that black hole is actually an airspace, and the black hole below it is a blood vessel. And then you see these green GFP bone marrow-derived cells arriving to the lung. So this happens when you implant a tumor in an animal, 
And even before the tumor gets to the lung, we labeled mice and transplanted and reconstituted them with green GFP bone marrow. And here this clearly shows that the tumor is secreting something, enabling the recruitment of these green bone marrow cells to the lung. We implanted red fluorescent tumor cells, and we don't see any red cells at this stage, which is approximately within two weeks of primary tumor implantation. These animals are very sick already, highlighting that there's other pathophysiological processes taking place before the tumor gets there. But on careful observation, not only did we see these green bone marrow cells, but within these green bone marrow cell sites, we saw red little tiny specks that were saying, what are these tiny little particles that were tumor derived? Were they simply tumor debris? And the answer was, well, let's look more carefully. That's what really makes a good scientist, to be really sure and really allow your data to, to help you make new directions. And when we did electron microscopy of these pre-metastatic niches, we found many viral-looking particles. We had absolutely no idea what, why these viral-like particles were present at these pre-metastatic sites. And because they fluoresced with the red fluorescent, they were tumor-derived. This is what got us into the whole area of exosome biology. Here you could see the particles. They're donut-shaped. They contain materials inside. Some are large, some are small. Very often, metastatic tumor cells shed particles of all different sizes, heterogeneous population. And we then wanted to study these exosomes. So what are exosomes? Well, they're simply defined as microparticles that range from 30 nanometers to 120 nanometers. They're different than the terminology given to microvesicles or microparticles, which are larger than 120 nanometers. And so the larger particles are made at the cell membrane. While the exosomes tend to be made near the perinuclear membrane involving the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi. So here's a blood sample showing a, to the right a very large circulating tumor cell, a CTS cell. They're very rare in one tube of blood. You might just get a few cells. And the people who work in this area have very little functional data on circulating tumor cells because there's so few of them to study. And billions of dollars have been spent by drug companies investigating circulating tumor cells as a biomarker or diagnostic marker. To the far left, you see these, the small blue cells, the exosomes, which I said are about the size of viruses, so from one tube of blood, you can isolate millions of exosomes. Of course, many of them are normal exosomes from your bone marrow cells, especially megakaryocytes. But a good percentage, up to 20%, are cancer-derived exosomes. And so we believe exosomes will provide a really novel and easily isolated um, particle be, to be used for clinical investigation as a biomarker and a predictor of metastases. And here, how do we really isolate exosomes? We do this by a traditional method with serial ultracentrifugation. 
So we can isolate a patient blood sample from mice with transgenic cancer, as well as cell lines. But I just want to also re-emphasize that if you're working with cell lines, there's fetal calf serum-derived exosomes when you use fetal calf serum. So we purposefully remove those exosomes if you're studying a particular cancer exosome, for, for example. These ultracentrification steps require high speeds. The final steps are 100,000 times gravity. There's also a purification step by sucrose cushion gradient. And then we confirm that we have exosomes by electron microscopy. And so there's other technology being developed, but at the present moment, most of us in the field feel that the traditional ultracentrification step, which takes several hours to isolate the exosome, is still the best bet for isolating purified exosomes. However, I do want to emphasize there's new technology, so I think this is an exciting area to, to keep paying attention to. And here's exosomes of pre-metastatic niche formation. We have to really understand the structural components of exosomes. And at the top, you see there's microRNA package. And as you go clockwise, you can see there's transmembrane proteins. Approximately 90% of the proteins are transmembrane. And they could have a role in adhesion. And then there's also the lipid bilayer that should be an area of investigation. Lipids play a major role, such as in HIV virus, in fusion. And going around, there's ribosomal RNA that probably no labs are studying currently. And there's different DNA. Our lab described double-stranded DNA present in exosomes, which I'm going to talk just briefly about. So if you understand what the content is, maybe we can really understand metastases. What is being transferred to these recipient cells at distant sites? What tumor information is being transferred? Can the actual recipient cells be transformed as a cancer cell? So these are some of the questions we are, are interested in. And so here was our first evidence showing DNA in the exosome. So on the right, you see those right bars, excuse me, red bars. And that was where we had biochemical evidence of double-stranded DNA, where we used shrimp double-stranded DNA. And you could see we could get rid of most of the DNA with this enzyme. Below, we actually do atomic force microscopy to detect double-stranded DNA by the physical appearance. And they look like spaghetti and string-like structures. And the height is approximately 700 uh, picometers, which, which correlates to double-stranded. Single-stranded would be 350 picometers in height. So most of the DNA, when we examine patient samples, or at 21% oxygen, consists of double-stranded DNA in the exosome. So just to reiterate, if we're going to understand exosome pathways and potential targets, there's a genomic component with DNA. RNA and microRNA, as well as the proteins and the lipids. So for the rest of the talk, we're going to focus on exosome function and exosome proteins, as we have re recently reported in our Nature Manuscript this fall, 2015. I think we have to pay attention as oncologists and clinicians and researchers that cancer is really a systemic disease. 
And there's many things that happen in a cancer patient that's not well appreciated. It's not simply about metastatic burden, tumor cell burden. There's a lot of other things happening in the blood system. There's thrombosis, so at the top of the list you see coagulopathies. Vascular leakiness is a major problem in multiple organs, hypoxia, inflammation, and finally, the, the role of tumor stem cell potential recruitment to these metastatic sites. So there's many things going on, and the question is, if we can isolate exosomes and label them with a lipophilic dye and inject them into naive, normal mice, can we really illustrate some of the, the functional roles of exosomes? And here, this is an experiment to look at lung endothelial permeability. And what we're comparing is exosome poor condition media. We collect the condition media, for instance, from melanoma cells growing in the Petri dish. We isolate the exosomes, but we save the rest of the condition media with all the soluble factors. When we inject exosome poor condition media into animals, we can inject this after several days of injection, even one injection. We never see any vascular leakiness when we give dextran one to two days later. Dextran is a protein that's labeled, and if it leaks out, you'll see a red fluorescent color, a Texas red color. On the right is only one injection, a physiological injection of exosomes. We give 10 mic micrograms, which actually contains several billion of exosome in number, which is the physiological range of exosome in a mouse with cancer or a patient with cancer. And after this one injection in the tail vein, the exosomes can fuse with these blue normal lung cells. So step one that we believe is very important in metastases is the exosome role in vascular leakiness. That starts everything at these pre-metastatic sites. And you can see they cause leakiness. And certain cancer cell-derived exosomes can promote leakiness at other sites, such as the blood-brain barrier, and potentially promote brain metastases. So if we look at other functions, what about the cells that uptake the exosomes in the lung after we give the intravenous injection? You can see in green and red, the bars to the left, there's many genes, approximately up to 1,000 genes that could be up or down regulated after only one injection of cancer exosomes. And to the right, after 24 or 48 hours, some of the genes that we see that are upregulated are pro-inflammation genes. But Inflammation molecules such as TNAF-alpha are critically important in rheumatoid arthritis. But we're getting hints on the bottom of that graph, the S100 family members seem to be increased in early metastases and even in late metastatic events, suggesting that this may be the, a very important molecule to study in inflammation. If we take the inflammation away, can we prevent metastases or stop metastases from continually to grow? We believe that this is a very important molecule at the metastatic site. And so, as I mentioned, we can label these exosomes with lipophilic dyes where they could be green or red, and we can inject them anywhere in the animal intravenously. So we can put them in the tail vein or retroorbitally. There's a sinus cavity that goes into the venous system. As well as interarterially, we can do left ventricular injections into the heart. And here, this is a tail vein injection of melanoma-derived exosomes 
And on the left, you see a circle of red. That's the blood vessel in the lung. And inside that blood vessel, you can see circulating particles labeled in green that are exosomes. But very interestingly, they have a choice. Either they, leave, they all leave the blood vessel within 24 to 48 hours. If they have nowhere to go, they get flushed out in the kidneys and the urinary tract in the urine. However, if there's certain molecules on their surface, they can bind to, to tissues. Once they get beyond the vascular leakiness stage, they can actually fuse with certain cells at distant sites of metastases, future sites of metastases. So in green, 24 hours in the lung, you see exosomes accumulating in a cluster of cells. So just like viruses, when one gets in, hundreds of other exosomes can get in. And so they're easily seen now when you look for the fluorescence. And here's melanoma also going to certain cells in the bone marrow. As we mentioned before, these bone marrow educated cells are now programmed to migrate and contribute to metastases at other organ sites. This was our first hint that besides initiating pre-metastatic niches, is it possible that exosomes can initiate organotropism? Since the melanoma exosomes were found in only organs where we see metastases and not found in the organs where melanoma doesn't metastasize too. So that led to our other co-first author, Bruno Costa Silva, who was interested in studying pancreatic cancer exosomes. And he injected those similarly behind the eye, and they travel throughout the body, and most of the exosomes labeled in green ended up in the liver, as seen in the bottom left-hand panel. This was very exciting to us that, you know, pancreatic cancer metastasizes predominantly to the liver. And here we see the exosomes in the liver and not other organs like the lung or the brain. Indicating, do exosomes really prepare metastases as opposed to tumor cells preparing metastases? This is initial evidence that the exosomes are actually preparing for future metastases. And this goes against all dogma, all scientists believe pre predominantly that tumor cells dictate their own fate and dictate metastases. So as you know, if we're going to talk about organotropism, there are several theories. One being the most famous is Stephen Paget in 1889, who published his work in Lancet. And he said, we must study the seed in the soil. The cancer is the seed. The distant organs is the soil. But, as, you know, I would have to say very few people listen to him while it comes to the soil part. I think our lab was one of the first to really study the soil. And he noticed that breast cancer metastasizes to different organs. In some patients, it went to brain. Other patients, it went to liver. Others went to bone. So he believed that there's a reason why cancer spreads to certain organs. Then we have James Ewing, the second theory of flow dynamics. And he didn't believe in Stephen Paget's theory. In the 1930s, he proposed that all metastases is based on mechanical flow which is partially right. Colon cancer tends to metastasize to the lymph nodes near the intestine. But it doesn't explain all the mysteries of metastases. For instance, melanoma, eye disease, eye melanoma, 
you would think it would metastasize to the brain being close by based on James Ewing's theory, but in fact it metastasizes to the liver. And there's plenty of examples of that. Lung cancer can commonly go to the adrenal glands, for instance. So we believe tumor exosomes may complement both systems, that the tumor exosomes are actually conditioning the soil. The soil is not already prepared in most cases that the tumor exosomes actually fuse with these cells and prepare them for metastases. So it's a sort of a new hypothesis on its own. And so here's different tumor organotropic models. These are the four most common sites of metastases besides lymph nodes. Where you, from left to right, we have lung, then we have liver, brain, and bone. And could the exosomes prepare metastases at these distant organ sites? So we really need to examine how do they get there? Are there particular adhesion factors that make the exosome stick there? And what's inside the exosome that educate these organs to be pro-inflammatory? And it's important, can we isolate them knowing all this information to be used for biomarkers and as for targets of therapy? So here we looked at more models of organotropism, the analysis of exosomes co-localizing in future metastatic organs. So on the top left, we have breast cancer, the MDA231 triple negative line. And when we get those exosomes anywhere in the body, especially behind the retroorbital injection site, they end up in the lung. And here you could see little red dots present in the lung. Well, the human pancreatic exosomes, as I mentioned before, end up in the liver. So we then decided to study more models of organotropism. And here we use the breast cancer triple negative model, MDA231, with its subtypes that metastasize specifically to bone, lung, and brain. And this was obtained from Joan Massiquet, a well-known metastases researcher at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And here we're injecting all these labeled exosomes in the retroorbital space. These are all images in these white little dotted things of the lung of, of animals. This is whole lung imaging, which is quite exciting. Could we ever image patients with exosomes and get an indication where their metastasis is being developed? And here you could see there's the bone tropic, 1833, the lung tropic, cell line exosomes, 4175, and the brain tropic, 831 to the right. And what you see is the lung tropic exosomes are clearly outnumbering all the other organotropic exosomes in the lung. You do see few bone and brain tropic exosomes present in the lung. And we found out that these exosomes are capable of causing slight vascular leakiness, but they're unable to fuse with cells that are in the lung, parenchyma itself. Only the lung tropic exosomes are fusing with cells, passing on the tumor information by the exosomes. And here we did more detailed studies at the electron microscopy level using a new technique that we're developing called photooxidation and conversion. And we simply label tumor exosomes, such as the breast cancer exosomes that are lung tropic, that should be found in the lung. And we inject those intravenously and then we section the lung 48 hours later 
looking for these tumor exosomes. So you can imagine it's almost looking for a needle in a haystack. And you see black granules with this photooxidative conversion indicating tumor exosomes. And here's, this is just one entire lung cell. On the right, you see an exosome binding to the cell surface. And the other red arrows, you can actually see tumor exosomes inside. The black arrows indicate endosomes. Those are the normal lung vesicles that are going from one organelle to the next. So we clearly have shown that exosomes can be found inside cells, and we're now determining where they go once they go inside. If we were to section the liver, we wouldn't find any of these tumor exosomes present. We found approximately one out of 20 lung cells taking up cancer exosomes by this technology. And then we took it even more forward in our studies not only were the exosomes going to certain organ sites, but the exosomes from the cancer cells were going to specific cells. So on the far left two panels, the exosomes and cells, one is green and one is red, you could see they co-localize in lung epithelial cells and lung fibroblasts. We use EPCAM and S100A4 to do those stainings. However, when we stain for macrophages or endothelial cells in the lung, those cells did not have any exosome uptake. Then the third panel from the left, we have the exosomes being taken up by the resident macrophages in the liver, the Cooper cells. And then the far right panel, we show that the endothelial cells in the brain are responsible for exosome uptake. So I think this is quite exciting. Once these cells take up the exosomes, they become re-educated, and a lot of information making the, the phenotype of these cells change. And then these particular cells can now educate the area cells around them in each organ site. So they're starting the whole initiation of the pre-metastatic niche. A very intriguing question, can exosomes prepare niches and redirect metastases? And so, I'm just going to show you here, if you educate Lung, with lung tropic exosomes, can we make a bone tropic breast cancer tumor cell metastasize there? And that's exactly what we see on the bottom middle panel where you see tumors. These breast cancers that only grow in bone now can grow in the lung if you educate the lung. And Ayuko did an adhesion panel identifying which molecules. The integrins turned out to be a very prominent one out of 40 molecules that were present on the exosomes. And here's a long list of 28 organotropic cell lines showing that different in integrin profiles were predominating for each tumor type. So for instance, for liver, it was alpha V beta 5. You see that yellow line. We also show beta 1 integrin is present in all cancer exosomes. And so now you could use drugs blocking the different integrins. So alpha 6 beta 4 integrin is for lung tropism. And so we knock down beta 4 integrin from those exosomes, and you could see when we injected the exosomes, the second panel, you don't see any labeling of the exosome. 
And we can overexpress the particular integrin in the bone tropic. Beta force makes them go to the lung, and we can get more of the bone tropic exosomes now to shift and go to the lung. So you see the red spots on the right. And we could do the same targeting and block liver metastases with the integrin of interest in the liver, which is beta-5. And importantly, patient samples are very helpful. People with lung or liver mets have a particular integrin expression present on the surface of their exosomes. So for lung mets on the left, these are patients with different different kinds of cancers in lung mets. They have alpha-6, beta-4 integrin. And patients with liver mets on the right have alpha-V, beta-5 integrin on their exosome. And we could use these at time of surgery, if you say plasma, you can predict which ones are going to have metastases because they can be stored away. You'll know who lived and which patients have died. And we just have preliminary results. We need to really improve that. But patients who didn't have metastases, such as breast cancer patients who later develop lung mets, already have the alpha-6, beta-4 integrin on their surface. The exosomes, as I mentioned, educate cells. And here you can see the S100 family. And the integrin itself has part of the education. Integrins are not only important for adhesion. So the exosomes are landing in particular sites. They're very important in the whole metastatic niche process from pre-metastatic niche, micro-metastatic niche, and macro-metastatic niche. And so we feel that exosomes are the primary particles and molecules responsible for initiating metastases at organotropic sites. And so here are the main co-first authors, Ayuko Hoshino, who's on the top, and Bruno Costa de Silva, who's on the bottom, who has a new job at the Champalimod Foundation in Lisbon. And Ayuko has been recently promoted to instructor and hopefully assistant professor in the lab. And we also have two postdoc positions if anyone's available in contacting us in the near future. They're available as we speak. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Leiden. <clears throat> now I'd like to welcome our second speaker, Dr. Thomas Kisslinger. Dr. Kisslinger received his MSc in Analytical Chemistry from the University of Munich, Germany. He completed his PhD investigating the role of advanced glycation end products in diabetic vascular compli complications at the University of Erlangen, Germany, and Columbia University, New York. Between 2002 and 2006, he completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto using shotgun proteomics to investigate organelle dynamics in mouse models of human disease. In 2006, he joined the Princess Margaret Cancer Center as an independent investigator. Dr. Kisslinger holds positions as senior scientist at the Princess Margaret <coughs> Cancer Center and as associate professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Medical Biophysics. He holds a Canadian research chair in proteomics and cancer research. The research interests in the Kisslinger lab are focused on the application of proteomics and computational tools, cancer biology, and biomarker discovery. His lab is particularly interested in combining in-depth proteomics with chemistry, biochemistry, and cell and molecular biology to gain novel insights into the function of poorly studied membrane proteins. Dr. Kisslinger will be joined by Dr. Simona Principi for the Q&A session. Dr. Principi obtained her PhD in immunopharmacology from the University of Palermo, Italy. In August 2011, she joined the Kisslinger Lab at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center as a postdoctoral fellow. Dr. Principi uses proteomics and molecular biology to better understand signaling mechanisms in the tumor microenvironment. A particular focus of her work is centered on exosomes and membrane proteins. 
I'd now like to welcome Dr. Kisslinger for his presentation. Susan, <clears throat> thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to this webinar on exosomes in the tumor microenvironment. So what I will do over the next 30 minutes is show our proteomics data and in particular focus on cancer-associated fibroblast-derived exosomes in the context of oral cancer cell progression. So I have structured my talk into multiple sections. I will first give a quick introduction on head and neck cancer, the tumor microenvironment, and cancer-associated fibroblasts. I will then go into some of our data of proteomics um, investigations of the tumor microenvironment. A particular focus will be on cancer-associated fibroblast paragrine-released factors, as well as their functional effects on tongue cancer cell lines in vitro. And here, just as a disclaimer, so our data is all unpublished, and it's in no, by no means completely done, and not everything can be always um, disclosed today. So head and neck cancers are a group of cancers of the oral cavity or the upper aero digestive tract as indicated here in this cartoon in, in different colors. And while these um, um, cancers are molecularly different, likely suggesting there are different type of diseases, collectively there's about 600,000 new cases of head and neck cancers worldwide. About 300,000 of these patients um, die of this disease annually worldwide. On average, the five-year survival rate of head and neck cancers is 40 to 50 percent, and the major risk factors for developing head and neck cancers are smoking and alcohol consumption. Although for nasopharynx and oropharynx, infection with certain viruses such as Epstein-Barr virus or HPV are critical risk factors. Head and neck cancers are generally treated with surgery, radiation therapy, or chemoradiation therapy, or combinations thereof. And due to the delicate anatomic locations of these cancers, this can have significant negative side effects on the quality of life of these patients. There are a limited number of targeted therapies available to, for head and neck cancers. For example, cetuximab, which is a monoclonal antibody against EGFR, which is often upregulated in these cancers. So that suggests that a better molecular understanding of head and neck cancers, as well as the complex interaction of tumor and stromal cells, are essential to better understand and better discover new um, um, targets for targeted therapies. So in the next slide, just a quick introduction to the normal and tumor microenvironment. So in a normal epithelial tissue, a well-differentiated epithelial layer consisting of one or several epithelial cells is um, separated from the stromal compartment by an intact basement membrane. The stroma contains a number of resident cell types, fibroblasts, different cell types of the blood vessel, or a number of infiltrating immune cells as well as well-delineated um, fibers of extracellular matrix consisting of collagen, fiber chain, fiber, um, fibronectin, and other um, types of proteins. Um, with the accumulation of key um, driver mutations in these epithelial cells that lead to the transformation of these cells, these cells accumulate a highly proliferated phenotype resulting in uncontrolled proliferation, ultimately resulting in an invasive solid head and neck cancer. And in the context of head and neck cancer, that can potentially happen um, through an intermediate precursor lesion. So within these solid um, 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 tumors, there's now a malignant epithelial cells as well as non-malignant stromal, com stromal cells, as well as some non-cellular um, non stromal compartments such as extracellular matrix component, oxygen tension, pH that are essentially important for the growth and proliferation of the solid tumor. It's now well appreciated that there's a complex crosstalk between these different entities of what's collectively called the tumor microenvironment. Now a major component, excuse me, a major component of the tumor microenvironment are cancer-associated fibroblasts. So while um, the origin of cancer-associated fibroblasts is somewhat controversial, so for example, they could um, could result from the activation of resident fibroblasts, for example, through so paracrine factors released by tumor cells, as nicely demonstrated, for example, by the first speaker. 
there's there's some um, uh, increasing evidence suggesting that, for example, infiltrating mesenchymal stem cells could different, differentiate to cancer-associated fibroblasts, or even epithelial cells or cancer cells could undergo an EMT-like process taking up a calf-like phenotype. So I'm not going to belabor this anymore, but you know, taking this into account, this suggests that um, cancer-associated fibroblasts are best described not as a definitive cell type, but rather as a cellular state, the calf state. And irrespective of where these cells arise from, there are a certain number of properties that define the calf state. So calves are likely fibroblasts like mesenchymal cells that have a defined phenotype, morphology, and functional properties that distinguish them from quiescent um, resident fibroblasts. For example, um, calf-like cells most of the time have a different morphology, so a star-type morphology as, compa as compared to a spindle-like morphology of a resident quiescent fibroblast. They are characterized by um, ca characteristic stress fibers and upregulation of various cytoskeletal components, such as, for example, alpha-SMA, which is the currently used um, gold standard marker for, um, for an activated fibroblast state, although that's also a little bit debatable. In addition, um, calf cells have an increased contractile phenotype. They release and synthesize more um, components of the extracellular matrix, as well as proteases that degrade this extracellular matrix. So that brings me to the goal of our study, the proteomic analysis of the tumor microenvironment. So we were particularly interested in using patient-derived fibroblast cells from the tumor microenvironment to discover paragrand factors that could potentially result in, in regulation of tumor progression, invasion, and motile phenotypes. To do this, we had surgical resections from tongue cancer specimens, and from these we isolated cancer-associated fibroblasts from within the tumor specimen or a chastened fibroblast from the tumor-negative margin based on, on pathological inspection. And here again, as a little bit of a disclaimer, using this particular type of cancer might have made our life unnecessarily complicated here because, of course, these are close by. Um, we then performed in-depth proteomics on these uh, matched patient-derived cell types to identify calf markers. So, for example, something like alpha-SMA, and I'll come back to that later, why that could be important, as well as um, signaling factors with a particular focus on exosomes and their protein cargo, as well as soluble secreted proteins that could, could interact with resident tumor cells. We then used functional assays to investigate what the treatment of tongue cancer cell lines with exosomes or soluble molecules results in what type of phenotypic changes this results. And then, while I don't have time to speak about this, so a particular interest of my lab is to use proteomics technologies to specifically look for surface marker expression as well as changes in surface marker expression. We then try to link particularly soluble molecules to resident receptors expressed on these tongue cancer cell lines. And of course, as you can see here in this point five, there's various other reasons why one would be studying um, membrane molecules, both from a translational as well as from a basic science point of view. Okay, and so as um, David has nicely shown us in the first talk, there's a huge amount of work um, that has been published over the last five to 10 years looking at tumor-derived exosomes. On the other hand, there's significantly less literature on fibroblasts or tumor-derived fibroblasts and their exosomes and the effect of these exosomes on tumor cells within solid tumors. So there's two papers that actually have been published both from groups in Toronto, from Jeff Rana's group, as well as from my collaborator, Rama Koka's um, group. And both of these papers um, use mouse fibro calf-like fibroblasts to show that exosomes derived from these um, cell lines has a tumor supporting effect has a tumor growth supporting effect on tumor cells. So for example, in this study by Simoda and all, um, fibroblast, mouse fibroblasts in which the four TIMP genes have been deleted 
demonstrate a calf-like phenotype using these classic phenotypic, uh, using that classic phenotypic characterization that I described earlier. Exosomes isolated from these calf types activate a number of, of um, pathways in resident cancer cells that lead to increased cell motility using in vitro assays or increased metastases using um, engrafting, um, um, engrafting type in vivo assays. So intrigued by these studies, we were now interested in, in asking the question, can we do similar studies using improved proteomic technology and patient-derived matched pairs of CAFs and AFs? So I'm actually not sure who's listening in the audience, so I'm just going to go a little bit about, over the technology so we're all on the same page before I go into some of the data that we accumulated over the last couple of years. So here starts with, as I said, matched patient-derived pairs of CAFs and AFs, and I'm just going to keep calling them that now. We then use different biochemical and fractionation approaches to extract proteins. We digest these proteins with an enzyme called trypsin to small peptides, and then we separate these peptides by nanoflow liquid chromatography. And then we electrospray ionize these peptides into, mass, into a mass spectrometer, in this particular case a QX active, that records a number of spectral information. That spectral information is then used in an algorithm called MaxQuant to identify as well as obtain precise relative quantification on thousands of proteins that are identified within these samples. This information and quantitative data can then be used in, in a variety of bioinformatics tools to delineate certain candidates or pathways for functional analysis. So there should really be a point 0.8 coming out from point 0.7, um, where we then use this information that we gained from these discovery-type proteomics experiments to derive at a number of functional experiments, and then use that data again, try to interpret the results from these functional experiments. So while this here is relatively easy, the fun really only starts at the end of this. Yeah, sorry, my mouse actually froze. Uh, uh, uh. Can somebody move to the next slide for me, please? Oh, now my mouse works again. Okay. Okay, so... No, we went one slide too far. Sorry. Okay, so now in detail, so this is um, the exact samples that we analyzed. So as I said, we had patient-derived human calves and AFs. We grew them in culture in vitro for short-term cell culture. And from these um, fractions, we isolate whole cell lysates that get extracted by a tri um, trifluoroethanol extraction method. We collect the serum-free culture-conditioned media, which we concentrate and prep in a similar way. And then we isolate exosome-enriched extracellular vesicles in a similar protocol that David described earlier. In parallel, we also use a number of established tongue cancer cell lines. And again, we look at the whole cell proteome from these cells. And more um, particular, we use a silica bead capture approach to specifically enrich for plasma membranes as well as the receptors expressed in these cells. And then as one does this, you know, it takes quite a bit of time, one can identify a bunch of proteins. And as I said before, that part is relatively quick. The fun only starts here. Okay, so first we try to um, isolate and characterize these patient-derived fibroblasts. This is what we did. So as I said, <clears throat> we had surgical specimens from tongue cancer patients um, from within the tumor margin. We dissociated these cells using a cocktail of enzymes or from the tumor-negative margin by, by pathological inspection. Red blood cells are then lysed, and then these cells are cultured in cell culture disc dishes that support the outgrowth of of a fibroblast-like cell type um, using published methods. So we have a number of, of patient-derived pairs. So we used four for discovery proteomics and five plus the four um, for validation. So what you can see here in the slide, the top band is a Western blot against alpha-SMA, um, and it shows an upregulation of this um, commonly used marker for an activated fibroblast state in the calves, indicated here in C, versus the AFs, indicated with an A. The band underneath is just a Comasi stain of the entire membrane following that Western blot. 
On the bottom, you can see an immunofluorescence micrograph of the cells grown in culture. So what you can see here is, again, an against alpha-SMA. So what you can see here is an upregulation of alpha-SMA by immunofluorescence microscopy, as well as this formation of this typical stress fibers that indicate an activated fibroblast phenotype. What's also visible here, of course, is that there's quite a bit of heterogeneity within these cultures. So one can see a lot of these activated cells in the calf cultures, yet not all cells are activated. But one can very rarely see them in the, in the AF cultures. We then used a, a gold standard functional assay, um, which is called a gel contraction assay, where these calves and AFs are embedded in a matrix of collagen. And after defined time, one can measure the area of this collagen block at the bottom of this 96 volt plate. Here, the, the assumption is that a calf, due to this increased um, contractile phenotype, will contract that shell piece, and that shell block will have a smaller area after defined um, time um, period of time. On the right-hand side, next to these pictures, one can actually see that indeed calves have a significant, yet small, difference in this contractile phenotype. And on the bottom, one can just see light images of these um, fibroblast cultures grown in low or high density, again showing this somewhat expected morphology. Okay, so we had um, cells that seem to um, follow this traditional knowledge of an activated calf phenotype. We then went on and did proteomics on these four matched pairs in triplicates each. So that's about 72 mass spec analysis. Here is a, a heat map of a um, unsupervised hierarchical clustering showing A on top in the dendrogram, these different cell types in blue whole cell lysate and green um, um, culture media and red exosome nicely split away. One can also see a, a number of protein clusters on the, on the y-axis. Some proteins are expressed in all fractions. Some fractions are more specifically upregulated in one or two of these um, cellular fractions isolated from these cell types. And as I said, we were particularly interested in looking at paracrine factors released from these cell types. So we focused in on the secretome. And that um, constitutes about 3,000 or so proteins. So here, now looking first at the soluble fractions, one again can see an upregulation, significant yet small, of a number of extracellular matrix molecules that would be um, what is expected of these cells um, as described in the literature. Similar to David, we perform electron microscopy to show that these exosomal extracellular vesicles are enriched for exosomes. One can again see this typical size and shape of these type of extracellular vesicles isolated from the culture media. And then here one can use the mass spec to show that um, the proteum or the cargo molecules within these exosomes is highly enriched for a number of known exosomal markers indicated in red comparing the relative expression of proteins in the exosome fraction versus the whole cell lysate. And the exosome fraction is also depleted in a number of intracellular uh, markers that are likely not to be present in these extracellular vesicles. We then performed um, enrichment analysis within um, the num where these um, um, proteins identified in the calf and AF secretome. And one of the most significantly enriched terms or pathways were proteins linked to cancer cell migration, similar to what was, um, has been shown by Rana and Coca et al. So here's about 150 or so um, proteins that can be mapped to these functional pathways. Some of them more expressed in exosomes and others more expressed in the condition media. If we now zoom in on this exosome-enriched cluster, what one, one can see multiple things. A, this contains a number of proteins that are linked to well-described pathways um, that are associated with cancer cell migration, such as proteins of the wind pathway, various RTKs, various proteases and growth factors. What one can also see if one looks at the heat map, there's again, as I said before, quite a bit of heterogeneity in these patient-derived cell lines. And based on these terms that are globally enriched within the secretome, there's little difference between calf and AF um, derived exosomes from tongue cancer patients. Nevertheless, some proteins are still um, 
have a trend towards upregulation. For some, actually, we have antibodies, so we can also verify these, um, these results. Okay, so now, based on this, we ask the question, so can we now isolate exosomes from these fibroblast cells and treat tongue cancer cell lines in vitro and induce a migratory phenotype using classic scratch wound uh, migration assays or proliferation assays. So we use a standard protocol to isolate exosomes and then in a time and concentration dependent manner we treat, um, for example here, this SSC25 cell lines with calf and half derived exosomes. So first, we did a dye tracking experiment where um, similar to what was described before, um, protein cargo and exosomes is labeled with a fluorescent dye and added to these epithelial cancer cells. And within a relatively short time, these exosomes are internalized by these cancer cells, which also leads to activation of various signaling pathways as assayed by phosphospecific antibodies and Western blotting, for example, the MAP kinase pathway. Okay, and then we started now to use an incusite instrument and a specific experimental setup to measure both proliferation as well as migration in cancer cells as a result of various treatment conditions. So again, we isolate exosomes using classic protocols. We, then we take these um, extracellular vesicles as well as the exosome-free media here termed EFM, um, and we use significantly higher total protein concentrations of this to treat these um, tongue cancer cell lines. And here it's just Western blotting in two of these pairs. So the pellet indeed expresses, for example, flotillin, a well-known exosomal marker, which is not present in the exocellular free me exosome free media. Okay, then we performed here now, and I'll show you multiple of these um, type of blots now. So here for one of these pairs, control, so this is in an incusite setup, that's image-based analysis of cancer cell growth following different treatments. Blue, control, that's just media. Green, exosome-free media, 100 micrograms per milliliter. Red, exosomes, 10 micrograms per milliliter. Shows exosomes have a stronger growth-inducing effect. Calf-derived exosomes have a stronger growth-inducing effect as compared to media. And at the 60-hour time, um, 60 hour time point, we then um, compared multiple of these pairs that we analyzed. Here again, this is um, blotted as phase object confluence treatment versus control. Red calf exosomes have a stronger growth-inducing effect as compared to matching calf exosome-free media. In addition, um, we used a migration assay, an automated scratch wound migration assay, so you can see in these images at a six hour time point um, following treatment either with media, exosome free media or exosomes. And on the right hand side, one can see a time de dependent quantification of one given pair. Again, one can see exosomes isolated from calves induce a more a migratory phenotype in these SSC25 cells as compared to a significantly higher amount of exosome free media or um, just, just bl blank media. And again, then in multiple pairs, analyzed in triplicate, one can also quantify this. And indeed, one sees a significant enrichment, uh, outbreak, or an, an enhanced migration of these cells treated with exosomes as to a media, which is still stronger than no treatment, but significantly less. Okay, nevertheless, we do that same experiment now with, with um Exosomes isolated from a chastened fibroblast versus um, cancer-associated fibroblast in orange or red, respectively. We can still see this increased migratory um, effect as compared to media, yet no significant difference in this particular cancer type under these experimental conditions between calves and aphs. Maybe a trend, but that's definitely not significant. And then um, very interestingly, and so that's very preliminary, that's just two pairs in triplicate, and here now not reported as a comparison to control, but as raw data. So here if we now um, treat these SSC25 cells with control versus exosomes versus microvesicles versus exosome-free media, we can again see an increased migratory phenotype induced by exosomes but not so much by microvesicles of this particular cancer type in this particular assay. In addition, 
This effect that we observe from exosomes is concentration dependent, as shown in these curves here. The more you add, the stronger the effect. So here one can see one microgram per milliliter total protein concentration, five or 10, but eventually this saturates. So if one then keeps eating more, there's no significant different, um, difference anymore. So we, based on these experiments, we are using 10 micrograms per milliliter. Also, interestingly, if one takes these exosomes and heat denatures them, um, this effect com is completely abolished. So this suggests that uh, the active molecule could be a protein, or alternatively, this could also mean that one requires an intact, functionally intact exosome um, for these experiments. So we cannot exclude that this heat denaturing destroys the structural integrity of these, of these um, microparticles. Okay, so now, um, while there definitely is an effect that we can show induced by exosomes in these in vitro experiments, there was little difference between CAF and NAF, um, which, which is what one would have expected um, from some of the papers that have been published in the literature. And there's many reasons why this could be in this um, particular cancer type. Nevertheless, based on the gold standard assays, so alpha-SMA, Shell contraction and um, also immunofluorescence microscopy, there was certainly was a small but significant difference between these matched pairs. So now we used our proteomics data and the precise relative quantification to ask can we, in a, in a, in a matched comparison of CAF versus matched AF, find proteins that are differentially expressed in at least three out of four of these pairs. So the number here, of course, of different pairs is still small, but we nevertheless asked this question. So on top, one can see three out of four, prote uh, three out of four um, matched pairs where proteins are significantly upregulated in calves versus AFs. On the bottom, downregulated. And that's about 100, 150 proteins each, so a small number. Interestingly, so if one looks at functional enrichment in these categories, and so over here bar charts with different type of um, um, categories, either gene ontology or CAC pathways, <clears throat> one can see that exosome cargo from, from um, calves significantly enriched in molecules linking to metabolism or energy pathways, which um, was not the case if one looks at the um, cellular lysates from these same cells as shown in the bar chart on the bottom. And then if we just take molecules mapping to these pathways, one can also visualize this here in this heat map. So again, and some heterogeneity, clearly visible, but definitely a stronger expression of, of certain proteins mapping to various um, metabolic or energy pathways. So that's quite interesting. Since there's a lot of data out there suggesting there's metabolic coupling between um, exosomes, uh, between um, the stroma and tumor cells in solid tumors. And there's even data out there suggesting that um, cancer cells um, release a significant amount of their protein content that is then taken up um, by cancer cells, in, you know, as published in some recent, recent papers, for example, by Santi et al. So while um, we are at the moment don't know what this functionally means, it certainly gets us thinking, can we derive functional assays where we can test this hypothesis um, based on the results that the proteomics um, provided to us? So now I'm going to um, switch a little bit and show some additional data that we have obtained. So as I said before, we've also per, we were also interested in finding markers that are differentially expressed between CAF and AF, similar um, to alpha SMA, and I'll show you why that might be interesting. <clears throat> so there's ample literature out there showing that various gene expression signatures um, uh, or, or stromal um, signatures in, in tumors correlate with worse outcome, or even certain molecules such as alpha-SMA or different um, calf markers such as FAP, and their expression correlates with various clinical parameters, most often um, outcome parameters in a variety of cancer types. So again, while our numbers are small, we ask the question, can we use these data set and see if we can find molecules that are differentially expressed in our matched pairs between calves and AFs isolated from tongue cancer patients. And here one can see, we go through a number of mining strategies, small number of molecules um, are significantly differentially expressed. 
You can then obtain antibodies for some of them, and here's one I cannot show you right now, but it's a molecule that is annotated as a cytos as a extracellular matrix related um, growth factor that we can show differential expression in these five additional pairs both in the lysid as well as in the media with relative good consistency. So what we're interested now is in using this antibody and annotated tissue microarrays to stain for this molecule and see if the expression intensity of this particular marker can be correlated to various clinical parameters in tongue cancer patients, such as, for example, worse outcome. <clears throat> In addition, as I said, we also, aside from looking at exosomes, we were also interested in finding just soluble molecules that are released by, by these fibroblasts, as well as receptors that are expressed on the surface of the recipient cells, the tongue cancer cell lines. So again, we can make use of our proteomics data to identify such candidate molecules or pathways. So on the top right-hand side, you can see the somewhat complicated 3D scatter plot where we take our entire proteomics data analyzed, uh, obtained from these four matched pairs of calves and NAFs. And in red here, one can see significant enrichment or upregulation of molecules in the conditioned media fraction. Again, there's about 400 of those. They're highly enriched in known growth factors, cytokines, etc., both by manually looking at it or using various gene enrichment, gene ontology enrichment um, bioinformatics tools. Now, to match these ligands with receptors on the cancer cells that could receive them, we, were, we performed in these two tongue cancer cell lines. Uh, plasma membrane enrichment strategies that uses silica bead coating. So here, the plasma membranes are coated with very small, positively charged glass beads. The electrostatically adhere to the apical plasma membranes. This is um, strong enough that one can lyse these cells without these beads coming off anymore. We can then use density gradient ultracentrifugation to enrich, highly enrich, for plasma membranes and proteins embedded or associated with these plasma membranes. And by biochemistry, shown here on the right-hand side in Western blots, one can show that these membrane fractions are 15 to 20-fold enriched compared to a lysate in known membrane molecules, yet depleted in, in um, organella markers for intracellular organelles, such as the mitochondria, ER, cytosol, or the nuclei. We then analyze both the membrane-enriched and the lysate fraction, and that gives us a global view that we can then further compare and enrich for plasma membrane-enriched proteins. And that's what we did here on the next slide, again, in a somewhat highly complicated um, two-way scatter blot. So here's on the x-axis is the SSC25 cell line, on the y-axis the SSC4 cell line, and then we do a log-scale enrichment of the biochemically enriched membrane fraction versus the lysate fraction, including statistical analysis of the two. And what one can see then here in red, these are membrane molecules expressed significantly on the, on the surface of both, in dark blue or light blue, only in one of the two cell lines. So it's a quite significant amount of receptors that one can now link these ligands to. And again, this is highly enriched in terms associated with membranes. So now, you know, again, where I said that's where the, the fun only starts, and even for us to do this for a living, this is still quite overwhelming. So one has 400 ligands and 1,500 receptors, and someone needs to link these together. So as a first pass, um, we made use of a, of a nice paper published last year in Nature Communications. It uses both um, biologically verified data as well as predicted data to link ligands to receptors. And then on top of that, of course, we have the relative quantification of these ligands in the calf as, as well as in the AF fractions that could go, of course, or this has to go into this um, into this calculation. And this molecule that I've shown you earlier, where I didn't show you the name, is actually one of is a molecule that that falls into this list that can be actually obtained recombinantly, where we are now doing functional experiments to test this. And more interestingly, there's actually papers that have recently been published linking this um, to both prognosis and interesting functional properties in a different type of cancer. 
So to summarize, so we have isolated and, char and characterized patient-derived calves and ass from tongue cancer cell lines, performed deep proteomics as, a, as an initial screen of these cells isolated from the tumor microenvironment to highlight paracrine factors released by calves that could induce uh, a, a proliferative or motile phenotype in, in tongue cancer cell lines. Using functional assays plus these proteomics data, we try to piece these two pieces of information together to obtain new insights into the mechanisms that get activated um, from, from that, that are activated in a tumor stromal crosstalk within solid tumors. We've identified various markers of an activated stroma, some of which we're trying to um, validate and interrogate in, in richly annotated tissue microarrays that are available to us here in Toronto. And um, we're also interested in using ligands and receptors and linking them together in a ligand receptor network for further functional investigation of these proteomic data that we obtained. And here's my last slide. As an acknowledgement, so Simona is really um, um, the driving force of this project, very challenging project, and she will join me actually for the Q&A session. She had lots of help from Salvador Mejia, who is a research associate in the lab, as well as various other lab members. And we are nicely integrated in Toronto in the Head and Neck Translational Research Group as very nice patient material. Um, this group is run by Fifi Lu and a radiation oncologist and Villa Shi that helps a lot with the pathology. Also, specific thanks goes to Laurie Ailes, who actually initially established these calf and NAF lines in, in her lab here in Toronto and uses them for similar yet different assays um, in her lab. And then also particular thank to Rama Koka, a close collaborator of mine um, for biological advice and, and collaborations along the way. And I'm happy to take questions from the audience now. Thank you very much, Dr. Kisslinger. Before we move to the Q&A session, I'd like to take a quick poll. We'd love your feedback on our event today. How likely are you to recommend this webinar to a colleague? Not at all likely, unlikely, neutral, likely, or extremely likely. I'll leave the poll open for just a little while longer. Please note that you must hit the submit button in order for your vote to count. <laughs> Thank you for your feedback. The poll is now closed. So we'll now move on to our Q&A session. Um, I'll start with a question for Dr. Leiden. Um, would you be able to comment on exosome trafficking and why certain exosomes travel to a specific organ? Yes, so why would the tumor exosome want to go to a certain organ site? That sounds quite peculiar. But cancer is really embryonic reprogramming. So we must go back to the embryo and study the role of exosomes. And um, unfortunately, there's not many developmental biologists studying exosomes, but we have preliminary work in our laboratory showing that exosomes are very important in embryonic development, especially in organogenesis. So we believe a beta-5 integrin exposed on the exosome and the embryo may help the liver getting for it to be developed. So this same program may be seen when we see cancer. This is just a hypothesis at this stage, but I, that's why I believe exosomes are going to certain organ sites. Thank you. Dr. Kisslinger, what do you believe is happening to the exosomal DNA? Um, is it being transcribed, translated, or integrated into the host cell genome? Do you have any comment on that? Well, I mean, hard to comment on this since we haven't looked at it. So, I mean, we are mainly interested in the protein cargo of exosomes, and that's just based on the expertise that we have in the lab in protein mass spectrometry. Certainly, there's different cargo in, in these exosomes, yet we have not looked at it yet. So it's really hard for me to comment. Um, if There certainly might be other molecules in there. Are they getting integrated? I cannot comment on this. Um, um, Dr. Leiden, would you be able to comment on that? 
Yes, so we do study DNA in the exosomes. And so the mystery is how do they get there in the first place? But if their exosomes are fusing with cells at distant sites, where is the exosomal DNA going, as the question was asked? And so we have some preliminary evidence that some of the exosomes um, from cancer cells, depending on the recipient cell, remain in the cytoplasm, while other cancer exosomes will enter the nucleus. Once they enter the nucleus, do they incorporate into the genome, or are they communicating with different aspects of the nucleus? This is still being investigated. But we're open to the fact that there possibly is genomic education. Thank you. Um, I'll pass the next question over to Dr. Hoshina from Dr. Leiden's lab. Um, for the presence of double-stranded DNA in exosomes, did you show it was encapsulated inside membranous compartments? Um, the person was asking if the experiments were done in the presence or absence of detergent or nucleases. Yes, so um, the DNA work wasn't done by Dr. Hashino. All her work oh, on her nature you. paper was done on proteins. Okay, so, um, so I think that's, you know, we could ask another question. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go pass the next question over to um, Dr. Kisslinger. Um, somebody was asking for clarification on one of your slides, so I'm just going to jump back to one of your slides here, um, sure. to slide 50. Um, on this slide, the, the blue line here, um, does the, con the blue control refer to conditioned media or just media? Just media. So this is blank media. So this is the real control. So there's nothing added that ever saw a fibroblast. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll, the next question for Dr. Leiden. Um, you mentioned that up to 20% of 20% of cancer-derived exosomes can be found in the blood. Um, so the question is, are blood-derived exosomes enriched for cancer? Would you be able to comment on that? So blood derived is exosomes are found in the plasma, and the majority of those exosomes, as I mentioned, are from bone marrow derived cells such as megakaryocytes. So with increasing stage, so stage one to stage four, where stage four is a patient who has prominent distant metastases, that's where we see up to 20% of the total exosome number consisted of tumor exosomes. And we figured that out because there's certain proteins that are packaged in tumor exosomes that are never found in normal exosomes. And with less stage, the percentage is quite lower. So it could range from anywhere from 1% to 20% of the total being tumor derived in a patient plasma exosome sample. Thank you. Um, the next question for Dr. Kisslinger and Dr. Principe. Um, how, mu how, much exosome, how, many, how much exosomes are you able to obtain from your conditioned media from your CAF experiments? Um, so the well, question that, was how much conditioned media would be required to obtain n micrograms of exosomes? Yeah, um, so the starting material usually that I've used for this kind of assay that I set it to be good enough to perform at least a couple of them, a uh, good duplicate or triplicate, has been starting from 40 million cells, uh, so growing 40 million fibroblasts into 200 ml of media, and then purifying and concentrating further this media up to obtain a protein concentration uh, of exosomes that's close to uh, 50 to 70, I would say, micrograms in total per purification. Thank you. Um, we have time for just one more question. Um, 
Dr. Leiden um, and Dr. Hoshino, would you be able to let us know what lipophilic dye you are using to label the exosomes for your in vivo studies? Yes, so we are using PKH26 and PKH67 regarding on which color you would like to use. And for the uh, electron microscopy lipidomic, um, the dye, we were using FM143. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to the speakers directly. Their email addresses are displayed on the screen. As a reminder, the webinar will be archived on the Scientist website, and you will receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available. I would like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today and for sharing your questions and comments. On behalf of the Scientist, I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Leiden, Dr. Hoshino, Dr. Kisslinger, and Dr. Principe, as well as our webinar sponsor, Beckman Coulter. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs>